Technology. All right, so kind of fun, you guys. This week, now that we got that test behind us, we're kind of done with aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and that stuff. We're gonna uh, kind of move a different direction with this economic freedom uh, area. And it's still related, but we're not gonna be using that aggregate demand, aggregate supply uh, type of model. So I think you'll, you'll enjoy this. Um, I passed out a sheet. If anybody came in that doesn't have the sheet uh, that are in my class anyway, grab that. Um, what it is is a, a list of countries. And so I kind of want to start things off by you guys picking a country. And ultimately, this will probably be related to your project that you're going to do. And so the, the, the list of countries, oh, actually, my bad. I guess I didn't see that one through 10 are on there. Uh, that's all right, though, I guess. I didn't watch to pick the United States anyway, so. It starts with 12. They're listed according to economic freedom. So it's got Canada, United Kingdom, starts with 12. I don't have one through 10 on there, which I can add. Let me grab my other side of the sheet. I was hoping that had a full list. But this is all in your textbook, by the way. We're in chapter 16. And this is the work of uh, kind of the the baby of Jim Gortney, uh, who the Gortney Institute is named after. That's who's supporting our pizza cause today. So enjoy that. Evan, did you want pizza? You can go no, get some. Good. Good. Okay. Um, so the top 10 list here, we've got uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, Aus Australia, the United States, Mauritius, Georgia, Ireland, Denmark, and Lithuania. So here's what I want you to do. On your sheet, I want you to circle two countries, one in the top half, which is, um, let's see. Oh gosh, I got this crazy color coded. Usually it's just in the quartiles. Um, or maybe it is in the quartiles, I'll get one. Yeah, they didn't do their normal color coding here. So uh, let's see, 50. So basically through 80, yeah, right there with uh, the yellow. So number 78, which is, I don't even know where that is, Krag, Krag's Republic. It's gotta be something related to the former Soviet Union, I'm guessing, but I don't know for sure. Um, from 78 through 162. So I want you to kind of pick a country in the top half and the bottom half. Your choice, maybe it's a country you'd like to go visit someday. Uh, but just pick a country, but it can't be the United States. So just any country other than the United States, go down the list. Uh, basically the first 77 countries, pick one from that group. And then the last countries, 78 through 162, pick that group. And I'm gonna go get some pizza. trip like that first week of December after we let out so that's something to keep your eye on by the way uh, we're also gonna have another trip to Guatemala uh, kind of after Christmas time frame before the semester starts so there's two different international trips 
I think there's gonna be a third one to double in two, but and Chris, what did you have? Uh, Australia and Ethiopia. Australia and Ethiopia. Okay. So um, the countries are listed according to economic freedom. And so that's our topic today is what does it mean for countries to have uh, economic freedom? And so what we're gonna be exploring is items of economic growth. And so one of the things I like to start back with is you know, what caused the production possibilities frontier to shift? We did this with like a long run aggregate supply. You'll see this in the textbook, but what was the things that make you have more beer and pizza? What things shift so that we'd be at point A with 100 beers and 60 pizzas versus point C, where there's uh, 80 pizzas and 130 beers. That's economic growth, right? If we have more stuff within the country, what causes economic growth? What were the things that shifted the production possibilities frontier outward? Increase in technology. Increase in technology, good. What else? What else would cause this thing to move? So a technological advance was one of them. Supply and demand? Supply and demand of what? How do we make stuff? What are the basic resources? First week of class, basic resources. Land, capital, entrepreneurship, labor. So those four, just the basic things that make help us make other things, right? That's what a resource is, is, a, is something physical, or it could be a person that then does something, right, is productive. So all the four basic resources. So if there's resource growth, <coughs> we have the potential to make more stuff. Right? So if we have more machines, if we have more tractors, if we have more laborers, if we have more entrepreneurship, all of that stuff causes real economic growth. And so that's what we're going to start to see as we work through this. Okay, I'm going to get this thing going here. Tonight you can go grab some pizza if you want. Okay, so um, Jim Gordon um, in the 90s uh, worked to develop this index that measured economic freedom. And so that's what we're going to work on here. But before we get too deep into it, I want to take us back to the first week of class. Um, in this class, we actually did a little bit more on, um, on jumping into Japan and automobiles, but those of you at Micro, uh, you got kind of this exact uh, presentation where we've got two people that want to um, attempt to make themselves as happy as possible, right? So uh, the study of economics, your extra credit question on your exam, by the way, what is economics? The study of trying to satisfy unlimited wants with limited resources. That's the most basic definition. There's other ways to define it too, but you don't want to get real specific. Like sometimes people start to talk about money and the exchange and supply and demand or something like that. Those are just, that, that's kind of too narrow. I mean, economics is a huge subject. It involves everything involving people engaged in communication and trade and transportation. and so. You gotta be kind of real general with what economics is. It's just people that are trying to make themselves as happy as possible. They have unlimited wants. And so now we've got this whole island full of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. What should we make, right? So our resources are limited though. And so if opportunity cost teaches us, if we wanna have more pizza, we have to give up some beer, right? So there's those trade-offs. Okay. So we're kind of buzzsaw through this part here, but we can think about two people deciding on what to make. So we got Tom with eight coconuts and eight fish, or 
he could trade around and do a little more fishing, but that's at the cost of coconuts, right? Same thing with Jen here, four and eight and three and 11. Those are her production possibilities. So then we get to our graph here of thinking that the trade-offs, and I'm kind of, again, I'm gonna kind of buzz a little quickly through this, but to move from point A to point B, for Tom, he gives up four coconuts and he gets four fish. That's his trade-off. For Jen, she gives up one coconut and gets three fish. That's her trade-off. And so now we can characterize that in terms of cost. Like, what does it cost Jen to go do uh, a food, to go get some um, a fish? Well, it costs her only a third of a coconut, and Tom over here has a one-for-one -one trade off. So people are different. Is that a fair assumption? People are different. We're not all identical. Yeah, yeah that's good news. And same thing with, that's what we, uh, the good news with international trade when we did that chapter in the first week is that countries just need to be different for there to be win-win situations with trade. So Tom's better at coconuts, Jen's a better fisher, and so they should get together and do some exchange. So there's our production possibilities frontier. What if we have Jen do all the fishing, Tom do all the coconuts since he's better at it, and we end up with the world's production possibilities frontier starting to look like this. Right, where it's bowed outward because we're utilizing people at their best capacity with Jen doing the fishing and Tom doing the coconuts. So now Tom has all the coconuts, Jen has all the fish, and can we make a deal, right? And so two fish for one coconut is the offer that Tom throws out to Jen. And so is that good for him? Of course. If he did it himself, it was a one-for-one -one trade off. If he can get Jen kind of maybe tricking her into getting two fish for coconut, he's gonna be better off. Is she getting screwed? Is she getting screwed with a two-for-one? Well, if we go back to her trade off, if she did it herself, she would have to give up three fish. So she's getting a deal too. It's a win-win situation by them engaging in trade because of their comparative advantage. And so two fish per coconut ends up being a deal for both of them. And so what this reflects, is that this is why it's really the most important model I think of, of economics because it, it teaches us that opportunity cost and how important it is and the benefits that we can get from trading with, Nina, with, with each other so through Tom producing all coconuts, he can now consume along this green line. When he operated by himself, he could only produce and consume. He basically ate what he made along this orange line. And so by using Jen in the sense of uh, engaging with trade, he can consume anywhere along here with this one for two trade off rather than one for three. Same thing's happening for Jen. If she produced and consumed her own, she could only be along this blue line. But by them doing this two for one deal, she can be anywhere along this green line. And so both Tom and Jen win from engaging in trade. So ultimately, where does this go? Well, we need to factor that in to economic freedom. How free are the Ethiopian, you, Corey, you had Ethiopia and- I had Japan and- oh, Who had Ethiopia, was it Jamie? Who, and you had Ethiopia too. What was your other country, Jamie? Jamaica. So, you know, are the people in Ethiopia able to trade with the Jamaicans or the Americans or the Europeans, right? That, if they can't for some reason because of the laws of the land or other things, they're not able to take advantage of this win-win, which is lower economic growth. So that's one factor that kind of um, comes out from this concept and why I always like to start off with this one. Okay, questions or comments, sir? So it's kind of a review from back from chapter one, really. So how does this Tom and Jen on the island really scale up for the whole economy? And here we have 330 million people now in the United States. And so they're doing the same thing. Who's a better fisher? Who's better at coconut harvesting? Well, that's you getting a business degree and going to work at a company where you've learned some skills to be good at what you do at, right? At your part of the company. Maybe you're an accountant and you take care of the books and you're like, well, I don't know what we really sell, but I take care of the accounting. That's fine. You don't always have to know the whole picture, 
but you are a part of a business over here that is engaged in trade, in selling a product. And that creates these win-win situations for the entire economy. All right, so what is economic freedom? So individuals have economic freedom when the property they acquire without the use of fraud, fraud or theft. So let's pause there for a second. So individuals have freedom when they acquire property without the use of those. So how did they acquire it? Bought it. They bought it, right. So they voluntarily purchased it. They didn't force somebody to make pizza for them. There was somebody who was selling pizza today at Casey's and we went and purchased property. We purchased the pizza today, right? And so we acquired property without stealing the pizza. And it's now protected from physical invasions of others as they are free to use, exchange, or give their property as long as they, their actions do not violate the identical rights of others. So who bought the pizza? Who bought the pizza today? Me, right? And the Gorton Institute, technically. So I'm the director of the Gorton Institute. So the Institute, as part of uh, spreading this economic freedom message here, was supporting the pizza. And so I had the right to the pizza. If somebody would have mugged Nate, my graduate assistant, on the way here, carrying the pizzas, what would we have done? Like, literally, they came up and just grabbed the damn pizzas. Chase after them? What else can we do? Seriously, let's pretend that somebody came up and stole. Does that happen in some cities? You're darn right. What what do we do in America? Call the police, right? 911. Maybe we call campus security, whatever. But that is part of this protection. So protected, my property rights of my pizza are protected from the physical invasions of others as they are free to use, exchange, or give. So now I'm giving you guys the pizza, right? I owned it and I've I've said it's okay for you guys to go grab some slices. And so I had the right to give it. All of that we take for granted, and it doesn't always happen in every country around the world in that way. And so um, we just want to have people have rights. You can do whatever you want. Kind of the general gist of it is you do whatever you want as long as what you're doing doesn't violate the same rights of somebody else. That's the idea of property rights and having kind of maximum individual economic freedom. All right, so any questions on that? All right, so economic freedom then, in order to get a rating, uh, what does a country need to look like? Well, we've got these five areas. And so the country needs to keep government spending and taxes low. Why? I want you guys to think about that one right now. We've talked a lot in this class about G and T and deficits and COVID spending and other things. In order to treat, achieve a high economic freedom rating, which is what we defined up here, individuals have economic freedom, blah, blah, blah. Why would government spending and taxes need to be low to get a higher rating? Why would that be essential part of creating more individual economic freedom? Yeah, Mike Paul. Okay, people well, might keep people from buying. What else do taxes do? Let's stay on taxes for a second. Samad? Uh, uh, yeah, it goes into debt, but let, let's think about the tax. What about the tax itself that's contrary to this? You guys need to read this as individuals have economic freedom when the property they acquire, let's say it's your wage, it's $1,000. You just got a paycheck for $1,000 that you earn without the use of force, you can go buy pizza or whatever you want. Tell me how taxes take away from that concept. Evan. Is there, the, the government's forcing you to pay taxes. Yeah. So if the government has a 20% tax rate, how much do you have to spend by your own will after paying taxes of your $1,000 paycheck? 800. Right? You see how economic freedom's been reduced? Some politician in Washington, D.C. is choosing how to spend your money, not you. That's contrary to what we wrote up here. And so countries that have government spending and taxes low are letting people 
choose how to spend their money rather than somebody else forcing them to pay for other things. Does that make sense? So it's just, again, trying to tease out uh, this notion of economic freedom in these areas. All right, provide sound money. So this one ties into inflation that we've talked about. How is the inflation that we're incurring right now at 8% in the United States, how is that taking away from your economic freedom? What are you missing up here when the country has high inflation? You can think to your $1,000 paycheck again if you want, or now we're, you're $800 after taxes. What would you prefer, 3% inflation or 8% inflation? Three, right? So the lower the better, because it's giving you more money again. Inflation is kind of like a tax, right? So next year, if you have $1,000, that $1,000 doesn't buy as much. And why is that? Well, the government, through their policies, have done something to inflation. And so countries with lower and stable inflation, which was one of your test questions yesterday, one of our biggies, right? Countries with low and stable inflation are now enhancing economic freedom. Your individual choices to do with your money and what you want to do has not been impacted by this external source. So levels of inflation from uh, Ethiopia to Jamaica to Japan and the countries that you guys picked. Property rights, protecting property rights. So when the pizza was stolen, I pick up 911, how fast do the police show up, right? In some countries, I'll let you know, the police aren't gonna show at all. So, of course, sometimes that's the case in the, in the United States in certain areas too, right? So in different countries, what is your police system, your court system? When you go to the courts, if somebody wronged you, do you have to bribe the judge to get the answer? Or can somebody else bribe the judge to get a verdict in their favor or something, right? So the court system and police system, the laws of the land that are they protecting property rights or not? Or do we have kind of a loosey goosey system that leaves our individual ability to do stuff kind of in limbo because we don't have strong property right protection? through police courts and laws. Okay, so and contracts are important. They're, they're mentioning contracts here as we engage with somebody that's part of the law. Contract law would be one of those things. The country must also refrain from imposing trade barriers. That was way back in week one. What's an example of a trade barrier? One, come on, one of you guys should remember one thing. International trade barrier. Jay, you're close. The, uh, so we import and we export things, first of all, right? So if we buy stuff from China, or we buy stuff from Ethiopia, or we buy it from Guatemala, what are some things that countries do that creates a barrier for that? Jay, Yes, a tariff, good. A tariff is a tax on imports. So if the government says, oh, we need some money, let's just tax uh, Jamaican goods at 25% or something. That sounds like a good way to raise money. Well, they're taking away, they're raising the price of foreign goods for the people. That's less economic freedom up here again if there's trade barriers. So quote, trade barriers over quotas, regulations, um, and then tariffs were kind of the main things that we explored with that. So when countries have low to no barriers, they score higher in terms of economic freedom. It's good for the people of the country in terms of economic freedom. It's good when that happens. And then the last thing here is regulations that undermine voluntary exchange. So what are the things that businesses have to do uh, to open? And so I think we mentioned even in this class, but in micro too, uh, occupational licensing, so if you want to cut hair or braid hair, technically you need a license to do that here in the state of Kansas, and it might be 1,600 hours. And you're like, I'm just a college student. I'm good at braiding hair. I just want to braid hair. You can't do it legally, right? That's a regulation 
that restricts your economic freedom, your ability to earn a paycheck because the state has some sort of hoops you have to jump through. Uh, one of the things they look at in here is how long does it take to open up a business? You'll see this in the textbook when you read it too. In some places, it might be 90, there's one that's even 180 days uh, in Venezuela. I don't know if any of you know Samir, he's from Venezuela. Um, and so to open up a business, you have to go to this agency and get this signed off and this approval and whatever, it takes 180 days. In Hong Kong, I think it was a day and a half. Um, I was able to start a limited liability company here in Ottawa for my real estate uh, holdings, uh, and it took me 45 minutes to basically form a limited liability company that gives me kind of a legal status as a business. And so the easier it is to start a business, the quicker you can do it is one less barrier, right? And so that's what with regulations, there can also be labor regulations. So minimum wage um, is, are the, is the minimum wage high? Uh, can you hire and fire people? Believe it or not, in some countries still to this day, there can be restrictions on firing people. Like this person is just not, a good worker and it's against a lot of fire them. like you know so that's some politician with a great idea I know how to lower unemployment it's illegal to fire people oh that's brilliant right you didn't really think about all the unintended consequences of, of that going on okay so that is our economic freedom um, measures and so then we'll talk about this number if you came in late First of all, you're welcome to go grab some pizza, but also come grab this sheet. You need to have a, a country picked out. This will be related to your, um, to your country project. So the list here is broke down into the kind of the top half and the bottom half. So I want you all to pick a country and then ultimately your sidewalk chalk project can be related to the amount of economic freedom of whatever countries that you pick. And, and then as we explore some of this, um, it might start to have a little more meaning to you. All right, so here is how the number gets calculated. So there's 162 countries with data out there. And then there's, uh, at least for this year, 42, I think they picked up one other variable in previous ones, but 42 variables <coughs> grouped into those five areas that we just explored. And then we look at that what's happened over time, and each country ultimately gets a number between zero and 10. So if you look at your list, all of the countries here have a number between zero and 10, and that is collecting information from those five areas from external sources and giving them an overall ranking that is just taking the averages of the five areas. So that's how the number gets created with these things that are gathering data. Here's the official categories. The size of government was the level of taxes. So uh, remember our cigarettes that you had to have memorized for yesterday? So Y equals C plus I plus G plus X. Well, there's the government. So one of the ways that we measure the size of government is here's the GDP. So around 20 trillion for the United States is the number that I like to have you guys keep. So if it's 20 trillion, and we look at G as a fraction of output, and right now let's say that the government is spending 4 trillion, then this gives you the fraction of it, right? So it's like 20%. Other countries, maybe it's 2 trillion to 20 trillion. This country would rank higher than this country as part of how that size of government gets done. Sound money, how's your inflation rate doing, freedom to trade internationally, collection of all those uh, tariffs and quotas and everything, and then regulations on the resources and businesses. All right, so here it is, and I'm gonna flip now to the live interaction version. So at freetheworld.com, you'll come to the Fraser Institute, and this is the index that you'll be using for your project. There is another index from the Heritage Foundation, so make sure you're using the Fraser Institute one. So there's a couple organizations that put together numbers. They end up being pretty similar with each other, but uh, the methodology is a little bit different. So there's a map of the world, and what it's doing, what it's done color coding is it's broke the world into the most free, the least free, 
and then the second and third. So it's broken into quartiles. And so around the world, this is what economic freedom looks like. And so where do you see the least amount of freedom just kind of eyeballing this thing? Where do you see the most? Where's the red? So the least free is the red. Where do you see the least free countries? Africa, right? And quite a bit in South America. So the orange is the third quartile. So when I asked you guys to split it into halves, so your countries that you pick, so here's, I don't know, my cursor just went to Japan. Japan is ranked 18th in the world with a ranking of 7.98. So they're pretty free. They're in the top quartile, they're in blue. Most free, red is least free, and then you've got these middle ones. And so all these countries around the world, we had Australia here at nine, the United States, Canada, and now we can kind of see things a little bit differently. Uh, there's Jamaica, 39th. And then Ethiopia, where are you? Over here is 144th. So a couple of you had Ethiopia. One week from now, I will be in Zimbabwe. And there's Zambia, there's Zimbabwe. 161. I'm going to be giving basically this talk and then some other. I've got like four hours that I'm going to explore different things of why is Africa so low? And so I'm, I'm going to be speaking to uh, some graduate students, uh, master's degree and PhD students in the sciences. So they're all kind of like bioscientists. They're not business people at all, uh, from what it sounds like. Um, and so we're going to kind of I'm going to try to show them where they fit in the world in terms of economics and why these five areas are some things that Zimbabwe could try to work on over time. Um, there's a few countries here, so Zambia and then Botswana is 45, so they're in the second quartile. But otherwise, it's a lot of orange and red throughout Africa, similar to uh, South America over here. There's Brazil, so a couple of you picked Brazil, 109. So that's a smattering of what the world looks like in terms of freedom. And then what's kind of fun is you can do this uh, play, is some of them are gonna be grayed out like uh, that we don't have any data. North Korea, uh, they don't tend to share their data very nicely, so they're not in there. Um, and then this is the Sudan. Have you guys heard about Sudanese and not so good of stuff happening over there? So their country's a mess. And so there's not even data to rank them where they are, but it would be very, very low. Um, Somalia is another country here that's grayed out. So there's just no data, right? The, I mean, they don't even have their country organized enough to be able to um, kind of use some of the, the data for them. Afghanistan, same thing, Turkestan, Ubikistan, all these stands over here in the Middle East. Um, so let me hit play, and then you can kind of see how the world's changed over time. Especially watch China. Here's red China. We're in 2000, 2001. When does China turn? Right there, 2005, 2008. We see some colors starting to come in here. 2013, 2015, right? So what happened, that's kind of part of this narrative, is that some of the countries started to embrace markets and economic freedom. And they're like, you know, the communists said, maybe the heavy hand of communism shouldn't be quite as heavy. Uh, look at what's happened in different places. And so they learned to loosen up a little. Um, there's still a lot of control over there. They're still in the third quartile, but they're no longer red, right? And so, you know, can some of these countries start to do some things uh, to improve the welfare of their folks? Okay, any questions or comments there? One last thing I wanted to do so that you guys possibly for your project can do this is that um, you can pick the country. So here's, I'm gonna do Javian. So Jamaica and Ethiopia. You can pick up to five countries out here. So, so basically the whole map got uh, blown out. You guys can't see this, but there's a little old Jamaica right there. It's still uh, uh, colored in. And so now you can look at the graph, but you can also look at 
uh, the data differently. So here is Jamaica and Ethiopia uh, with the graph and then size of government, legal system. So here's the five areas and what you're gonna see is that Ethiopia is the red line is below them. But you also start to see what they've done over time. Are they improving or have they flattened out in different areas over time? So that's kind of nice to look at. You can also get the raw data of each of those five areas. These are the numbers then that get averaged. So there's regulation area, freedom to trade, sound money, property rights, government. Take this number plus this number plus this number plus this number plus this number, divide it by five and it equals 7.71. So what I like about this index is that they kept it pretty simple that you can unravel the different areas and it allows you to see where countries might be strong or pretty weak. So right here, Ethiopia suffers big time in terms of legal system and property rights. That means their police suck or are non-existent and their courts suck or are non-existent and therefore the law of the land sucks or is non-existent. So corruption runs wild. In terms of economic freedom, uh, you have to kind of build your own fortress to protect your property, right? So in a lot of developing countries, the first thing people, what, let me see if you guys know this answer. When you buy a piece of property to build a house in a developing country, what's the first thing that you build? The wall, good, who said that? Okay, yeah, the wall. So if you guys have visited other countries, it's usually a concrete wall around it, and sometimes there's razor wire, or they get creative with like broken glass. It's kind of cool how they, they do it. It's at the top of the wall, it might be a mound, and in the concrete, they'll put broken shards of glass to try to have that be a barrier to get their stuff. Uh, because you can't rely on uh, police and courts um, to protect your property, so you have to do it yourself. Uh, and whatever that takes. So now think of it as you're spending resources to kind of self-police and that takes away part of uh, your own economic freedom. Okay, questions or comments there? So that's the map and you can get like the whole data set and all the publications and stuff. So let me come back to the PowerPoint here. So this was the map that we just did in a more interactive way. Here's the top 10 countries at a snapshot. So the United States dropped as low as 19 in one rating, by the way. So it's usually been in the top 10 for most of the existing United States, but some of the policies in the United States have changed um, over time. And so some of those take away in different areas and can uh, negatively affect it. Certainly the 8% inflation is going to hurt the United States. I think a lot of other countries will probably have some inflation too. So we're not sure how that'll all shape out. Because they use variables like real GDP, we learned about lags, right? Time lags, that it takes time to get the data. So when we're doing things here in 2022, we're actually looking at the 2020 data. So the next index that'll come out is in the fall of 2022, and it'll be using 2020 data. So there is a little bit of a time lagging. So this is long-term thinking here. Here's kind of a smattering of different countries. Some of you had Brazil, uh, India. I, I've got some money invested for retirement in Indian country uh, companies because of this ranking. Um, and so Germany, Japan, a couple of you had Japan is up their ways. Mexico, our neighbor to the south. So it's kind of interesting. Canada's in the top 10, Mexico's 76. So they're uh, at least in the second. I think the reason why Mexico is probably as high as they are is because they do share a border with us. And then over years, we've had the free trade agreements and stuff that have made it more friendly with trade uh, with Mexico. And then here's part of the, the bottom countries. Venezuela being uh, at the bottom for a long time. So these are countries that are kind of in turmoil in different ways. Okay, so um, what's been happening over time with economic freedom? So there's good news. Um, has poverty gone up or down around the world? Poverty. Has poverty gone up or down? What's your gut feeling? I wouldn't expect you guys to know this for sure, but Spots is down, Jace is down. Yeah, it's down like 30%. And, excuse me, I'm going to talk with my mouth a little bit. Can't help but that pizza sitting there. Um, the reason it's gone down 
is not because of international aid. Do you guys know that we waste lots of money by giving money to these countries? It's awful. It's really awful if you start to study it. Sounds great. Let's send over some monies. Let's send some aid to Africa. But Africa remains with terrible outcomes in terms of per capita income. So we start scratching our head as economists concerned about the Africans and, and people in South America and developing countries. Uh, if you've gone and experienced these countries and seen poverty and the way people are living, does it have to be that way? So economic development, and part of what we're doing here with economic freedom, is a way to hopefully show how things can change for the long haul. And so economic freedom has been increasing slowly but surely in some of those countries, and we've seen some dramatic rises in uh, outcomes in terms of income, and therefore less poverty. And so what's happened is, the, the, the short of the story is, free markets, capitalism, and economic freedom is why poverty is down 30%. International aid programs have done close to nothing in terms of benefiting people. Because ultimately, uh, in many cases, it goes to a corrupt leader, right? And so you give money to Africa, and that leader says, oh, thank you for the $5 million of aid. We'll start building roads and bridges. Those roads and bridges never get built. And so they contract with their golfing buddy, and then the golfing buddy gets the money or some of the money, right? And they have their friends and some cronyism goes on. And in most cases, it doesn't trickle down with the, uh, to the people that we uh, were hoping to help. And so, by changing the structure, by changing those five areas, that's where we've seen the most promising gains in these uh, four countries. So overall, the ratings, the actual numbers have gone up over time. So the world's becoming more free in general, and that's been good news. Okay, this particular study is kind of interesting and very relevant now with Russia invading Ukraine and threatening to invade other countries. So this study was done uh, back in 2015, I think it was, or 2016, 2017. And it was kind of a natural, what's called, what economists call a natural experiment. So the former Soviet Union broke up. Does anybody know what year? It's kind of some good history to, to know. It was certainly not more for trivia, not like you have to know this to be, uh, you know, really smart with your job that you're going to get after you graduate, but 1991. So the, the Soviet Cold War, where uh, Russia was the big threat, and Russia owned most of the um, territories. So just, I think, to give you a better idea, let me go back to the map for a second. So here's Russia, and then here's Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, basically all of these bordering countries was all part of the Soviet Union. And then, I'm sorry, Romania, all kind of in here. All of that was the USSR, right? And so that was big communist Russia uh, that had taken over those places and was trying to rule with a communist uh, heavy hand. And then in 1991, they broke up. Well, what's interesting is that these countries now had the opportunity to run their country differently. They didn't have to continue on with a communist type style place. They could adopt market-based systems and basically put economic freedom type things into place, right, to score high. And so of those countries, we had 25 uh, countries that were part of the USSR. And so we can look at their outcomes and how they changed. And so the countries that adopted market-based policies ended up having 4.5% growth rates in GDP. And countries that were in the middle had 3.78. And countries like Ukraine, who did not do economic freedom, had lower rates of growth. And so these rates of growth can make a big difference over the long haul in terms of the outcomes that I'm gonna to get to here in a, in a little bit. But 
those were rates of income growth for the different countries over time, and it basically tips its hat to economic freedom, that that was something that created economic growth, that created more beer and pizza through, uh, through adopting those tough sorts of policies. Here's the other thing that's going on. High income countries grew at 1.25%. So we kind of slowed growth over that time frame, uh, over both these time frames. But the developing countries had huge gains. So again, they were adopting economic freedom type policies and market-based solutions. And so now income inequality among nations is narrowing. Now you guys have maybe heard the outcries of, oh, income inequality, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Not true among countries anyway. So within countries, uh, that can vary too. Uh, but uh, across the world, the poor countries are getting richer faster than the rich countries. Does that make sense? So these are growing kind of at a flat rate. The developing countries are going up. And so the income per person around the globe is actually closing which is good news for the world. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so here's that income difference. So in this chapter, you're gonna see real GDP, but it's also gonna have this PPP adjustment. So purchasing power parity, we're gonna measure everything in dollars. And so we might say, well, it's not fair to look at Ethiopia, because 5,000 bucks buys you a lot in Ethiopia, right? You can almost hear somebody saying that. Whereas you need, gosh, in, in the United States, you need 40,000 to get to first base. Some sort of comment like that, right? All of that's been leveled out. Basically, that issue has been taken into account by looking at the purchasing power of the basket of goods in Ethiopian currency, if we're talking about Ethiopia. they We've leveled the playing field so that this is... You know, if we look at the dollar menu at McDonald's and let's pretend that they still have a hamburger for a dollar, this is literally 5,754 hamburgers that you can buy in Ethiopia or in these least free countries versus 44,198 hamburgers that you can buy in the United States. Does that make sense? So the income has been kind of leveled the playing field, taking into account currency and purchasing power uh, inflation gets kind of rolled in there as well, so that that's all uh, as even as it can be in trying to compare countries. So this is pretty significant, right? This is the overall income per person in all of those countries that you see in your bottom, uh, bottom part here. So from like 108 to 162 on your sheet, all of these countries averaging their income, it's 5,700 hamburgers in terms of real purchasing power. In other words, it would be the same thing as if they did live in the United States, they'd only have $5,700, right? Pretty sad, pretty poor in a big way. Okay, and then we see the pattern here, right? I mean, this is double. This is not insignificant. If you're poor and you're hungry and, you know, struggling, is it nice to have double the hamburgers, double the purchasing power? Yeah, it's huge, right? So even going a little bit from these disaster of countries in terms of policy with no police, no courts, no freedom, all of that stuff, kind of substance living, um, going from place to place, even a little bit of structure gets you a lot. And then it's another huge jump as you start to build on these areas, regulations, laws, government spending, uh, inflation, whatever, all those five areas. And then of course the most free countries are the richest countries around the world in general, when we average them out. So questions or comments there? So that's our income, thinking about GDP. So that's good, we have more income, more freedom. But how about life expectancy? In more free countries, the average life expectancy is 80 versus 65. Is that a lot of time? 15 years? Is anybody in here 30 other than me, 30 or older? That's over half your life, right? That's, that's real. When we start talking about society and things we care about, 
living is pretty high up the list, right? Staying alive, that's kind of a good thing. So this is a big outcome. So these things go beyond money is what we're starting to get into. This is beyond money and income and dollars, but just life expectancy. And again, we see a pattern here of countries that have better economic freedom with the rule of law and other things continue to have people that are living longer as we move through the quartiles. Infant mortality, how many of you like babies? I don't see too many hands going up, but I like live babies as opposed to dead babies. How many like live babies? Ones that are living instead of dead babies. Okay, I'd like to see all the hands go up, I hope, right? So infant mortality rates, that's what we're talking about. Um, deaths of babies. And so here, it's huge, right? So this is per 1,000 live births. We lose 39 babies in countries where there's not as much freedom. In the most free countries, we're down to five. That's a lot of babies, right? So the ability to stay alive at the end of your life and now we're seeing at the beginning of your life uh, changes depending on if you're in a relatively free uh, society with high economic freedom, high degrees of economic freedom or low. So one of the things that I like to look at, especially in the, with the Gordon Institute is the poor. I really don't care about the rich that much. Um, how's the bottom doing, right? Those are the people that have maybe disadvantaged uh, circumstances or something else. So I really could care less for the most part about the gap between the rich and the poor. So many people are concerned about the gap. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Um, I don't really care about the gap. I care about real people at the bottom. What, what's their opportunities? What's their food in their stomach? What's their shelter and police protection and courts? What does that look like for the poorest of the poor? All right, so in this bottom poorest of the poor category, right? The income share of the bottom 10%, not even the quartile. So we're taking the bottom 10%. What this is showing is that the share of income for the nation is pretty similar for that poor group. So this is the share of income across the board. So then this next slide kind of hits home of, where do you want to have this two to three percent share? Well, in the rich country, of course, right? So three percent of 44,000 gives you a lot better outcome. So now we're looking at the poorest of the poor, 1,558 hamburgers versus 12,293 hamburgers. So the poorest of the poor are much better off in countries with more economic freedom. So when we think about the gaps, I like to get people really trying to question that. Uh, if the poor, if the rich are going up like this and the poor are going up like this, there's a bigger gap today as opposed to yesterday maybe. But I don't give a darn. What's happening to the rate of return of the poor? Because in other countries, if it looks like this, if we have, let's just say we have more, let's say, let's, let's really tax the rich, right? Let's tax the rich and then give it to the poor. So now the gap is smaller. The gap is smaller, but the poor are worse off, right? I should be doing this a little nicer with the graph, but are you guys getting the gist of what I'm saying, right? So by having policies that decrease the gap, could potentially make the poor worse off than if we just didn't care about the gap. So I don't give a damn about the gap. Let's look at what's happening to the poor. Are they really getting more food, more shelter, more clothing, more opportunities for education? Is that stuff happening or not? Let's not get wrapped up with income inequality in the gap. It's a measure we can look at, but don't get wrapped up in it because this is what we should be focused on, the bottom. And the bottom are clearly better off. Even if income inequality is higher here is what I'm saying, the poor are a lot better off than they are in any of these other three uh, countries. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so 
poverty rates. So if you guys heard of the $2 a day, living on $2 a day type of thing. So that's kind of a common measure that the United Nations uses. And so that data is collected. And you can see here, they, they show $2 a day, $3 a day, $5.50 a day. And by the way, when we're doing this, that is a Starbucks, right? Can, we, can you guys go buy a Starbucks right now for $5.50, if not higher? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's how much people are living on in a day. And that's the people that are higher paid. Look at this. It's 72% of the freaking people in the country are living on $5.50 a day, a Starbucks, your American Starbucks. That's reality in countries that don't have much freedom, that we're at 72%, whereas we don't see that very much over here. Some of the countries still have, that are, are have the most free, um, are still developing a little bit, because this is kind of a long-term project, and so those are averaged in here. If we just had the United States only, it would be uh, a lot smaller, if it was just the US only. So remember that we're averaging all of the most free countries when we do this. But again, we see our standard thing here that there's this amazing correlation between the amount of economic freedom and the social outcomes that we care about. Not just GDP or money, uh, but the people, how are we impacting poverty? Okay, questions or comments on that one? All right, political rights. Where do you want to be gay? Where do you want to be a woman? Where do you have the most voice of the government, right? In making change in how the countries run. It is in most free countries. In other countries, the rights of people are less. And so again, we're kind of picking up that theme that countries that have more economic freedom, which is in part, a small part of it, is democracy. I think I've mentioned that before, that sometimes we get too hung up on democracy. Well, what does that mean? I live in a democracy. It just means you get to vote, right? And in some countries, if we have corruption, your vote's really not counting. You think it might be counting, but how did Putin continue to stay in control as long as he had? How have some of these leaders done that? So there could be corrupt uh, uh, systems that they're in theory have a veil of a democracy, uh, but that doesn't work. And then there's other problems with democracy, with majority rule. So of course we have minorities that get trampled on in whatever form they are because majority rules. And so, um, so democracy is a piece of the puzzle, um, but kind of small relative to the overall picture of economic freedom. Uh, but that is picked up in some of those variables, the four, 42 variables across the, across the system, uh, democracy is a part of that. And we see better outcomes in terms of political and civil rights in more free countries as opposed to less. All right, and so gender um, equality. Where do you want to be a woman? Women's rights are higher in more free countries. So we tend to see rights across the board. And so in some other countries, uh, especially in the Middle East, uh, women don't have the same rights as men. It used to be that way in the United States too, right? Um, if you guys have done your history, women couldn't vote for a while here in the United States and uh, couldn't own property. The husband had to own the property. So all of that stuff has evolved over time and it's still evolving in other countries as well. And so this end up, ends up giving us a metric of, of how that's progressing. Okay, and then happiness, finally. How do we, how do we measure happiness? Um, kind of a nebulous thing, but um, you know, you're basically asked, uh, on a scale of one to 10, do you consider yourself happy or not, right? So it's, it's called subjective well-being. So economists collect data on that, and again, people self-reporting that they tend to be happier in a free country as opposed to a lesser free country. All right, so that is some of the benefits that we see from uh, around the world. And so let's talk about your project now. Um, let's see, I think I got my sidewalk chalk. You guys can work on this anytime between now and, and Friday. Now 
now that you've gotten a little dose of economic freedom, uh, we are not doing the Bitcoin one, so I decided to just stay, it'd be better to focus into um, economic freedom since we didn't get into Bitcoin as much anyway. So the purpose of this review is to give you a better understanding of economic freedom by digging into some specific subtopic of your choice. Pick a country and write about the five economic freedom areas. So you only have to do one country. I wanted you guys to pick a, a relatively free country and a relatively uh, not so free country so that you kind of have the contrast between as you, as you dig in. And you can talk in general with possibly your sidewalk talk. Discuss why you think it has the ranking that it does so you can investigate those five areas and look at what uh, they're high in versus what they're low in. And I would recommend you guys using, you could use the USA as a, as a benchmark since you guys are in the United States. So as part of the way you compare it, um, I'll give you liberty to, to take that a different direction as well. But let me go back to the free the world. So let's see, give me one of your countries that was in the least free other than Ethiopia since we've done that one already. Egypt. Egypt, okay. All right, Egypt and the United States. So now, when you have your country, you can go back to the data set and look at the number, and you can see where it's low and where it's high. You can go to the graph. This is the overall score, but here's the five areas, size of government, so the United States is the orange, Egypt is the red, sound money. Now this is kind of an interesting part, so you can kind of look for interesting things that go on. Around 2012, Egypt and the United States were ranked similarly with inflation or with, because we're on the sound money button, and then it kind of diverged and then Egypt's done a little bit better. Uh, so Egypt has a little more higher volatility at least with that. Regulation, so you can go back and kind of compare the numbers and see where they're low at. And a lot of times if you just look at the raw numbers, you can kind of see, oops, I guess I got rid of the United States there. Which one they might be extra low on compared to the United States or compared to somewhere else. Legal system and property rights, right? So this is a big gap. So there's your corruption, there's your there's your number of something to talk about. Um, and that's a lot of the countries, that's, that's like an important linchpin. So all of these things are kind of interdependent to some degree. And so what I found, uh, I presented in Guatemala, and I, I suspect this is gonna be the direction of my African presentation too, is that the, this one's going to be low. And so even if countries are high, Sometimes you'll see that maybe they're even higher than the United States in this one, like one category they're higher in or something. Uh, without having strong legal system and property rights, then kind of nothing else works, right? It can really bring down the country in terms of their um, uh, income that they have per capita. All right, so let me go back to the doc camera here. Okay, so you got an introduction, about a paragraph for each area, and a conclusion. Um, so again, you don't have to use the United States, it's just one idea, you could pick another country. I think if you guys did both of the countries, that might be an interesting way to do it. So I just want you to be interested in it, that's why I wanted, those of you who came in late, I had everybody pick a country in the top half and the bottom half. And you might just use those two countries for, if whatever, for whatever reason you picked them, or maybe you can pick a different country that you're interested in, and then you can kind of compare uh, the two, or you can use the U United States. Um, okay, so Bitcoin, this one's done. No, we're not, we're just scoring that. Should be double, typed in double space, 300 word minimum, 1,000 word maximum. So it's not meant to be a big burdensome paper, uh, but give you enough to kind of whet your appetite. Should include a short summary of economic freedom. So that's kind of the talk that we just did. You guys will have the recording if you want to listen to me talk again on it, or um, I'd be happy to give you the, these PowerPoints so that you can kind of uh, look at it too. 
uh, but just kind of a general, and, and it's all, in, I, maybe I should just point you to your textbook. So this whole chapter, I just gave you a summary of some different talks that I've given. Uh, this one was from Alaska, was the one that I just gave. Uh, but your textbook kind of walks you through that too. So all of the content is, is, in, your, is in your book as well. Um, and then some sort of subtopic. So the subtopic topic is just meant to be maybe women's rights or maybe, I don't know, environmental or just something that's uh, different about the country uh, on how it relates to economic freedom. So like all those outcomes, uh, happiness, uh, infant mortality rates, um, all of those things that I just walked you through, those would all be examples of subtopics. Like how does this country do? Because now you can look at your particular country. You can look at Ethiopia, you can look at Jamaica, and you can say, how do they rate with income for the nation GDP? So the United States is at 55,000 and Jamaica is at 15,000, you know, but yet they're both free. There'll be kind of an interesting story um, that you can pick out when you identify individual countries with their uh, particular ratings and information. Okay, uh, and then finally, economic uh, personal opinion of what you think about economic freedom and the subtopic. So just kind of a short little write up there. Um, this Economic Freedom Bitcoin Review is due Friday. And this is Friday, like midnight. So you can work on it anytime you want. And then we're not going to do the 60 seconds. So I'm going to get rid of this one. So you don't have to do a video. And I want you to get some sidewalk chalk. You can borrow some from somewhere, student affairs might have some, or your dorms or other people. And I want you to fill up the sidewalk between here and my office and the calf. So that's your, that's your canvas. And just make a advertisement about economic freedom. Maybe it's about your country, maybe it's about um, infant mortality, save babies, increase economic freedom, right? So all it is is a kind of like an advertisement for economic freedom. And so you'll be graded on that and your write-up and you will upload a picture. So after you do your sidewalk chalk uh, deal of maybe it's a saying, expression, you can do, draw something, a picture, a, a flag or whatever. Um, Take a picture and you'll upload that as part of your project along with your write-up. Okay, any questions on the project? All right, uh, so be as creative as you want. Try to avoid writing full sentences. Treat it like a print ad on a website banner. Uh, get rid of Bitcoin. Economic freedom must be included. So you must include economic freedom uh, prominent in your display. Take a picture of your work and upload it. This syllabus right here is on Blackboard if you need to reference a copy um, that's in our announcements. So, did I see a hand up, Robert? Are you just stretching? Okay. Anything else? All right, so we'll pick up on some more stuff on Thursday, and we'll see you then. Thank you.